Hello and welcome to another session of yes of owl bear soup made <laughs> with fresh gelatinous cubes. <laughs> e e. <laughs> I, An eerie uh, start. <laughs> right. I, I we we were watching the chat and someone mentioned that and I was like, oh man. Uh, I, I never I thought know. about what was in the owlbear soup other than the argument that we have that it's is it is owlbears in the soup or is it is it soup exactly. for owlbears? In and I, as we all know, it is soup for owlbears. Right, right. So and is soup for owlbears made out of mostly gel gelatinous cubes? And if they are, are those gelatinous cubes cubes that have devoured owlbears? Is that mm. so it's kind of a what? uh like a, a, a vengeance play? Yeah, it's a, it's a dark circle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't know. These are the mysteries. We'd have to ask the chef, and uh, the chef's not talking. <laughs> no, no. Chef's, chef's not letting us know. Maybe that'll be one of our adventures, uh, is to find out what exactly Chef Alberti puts in the soup. <laughs> oh my, that, that sounds like a finale, and I, I don't know that I'm ready for that yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, here we are. We are uh, back again on the Saving Throw Network. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Chat, thank you so much for joining us. I don't know if I said it, but my name is Justin. Oh, and I'm Rich. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got a couple of fantastic uh, guests today. We have the amazing uh, game designer and uh, graphic designer, Daniel Solis. And then also um, the fantastic GM of the show that's coming up next, Stephen Pope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm excited we'll be talking to them later about uh all sorts of game hijinks which should be a lot of fun um yeah. but uh before we get to that we've had a couple game hijinks of our own lately <laughs> oh yeah yeah right <laughs> oh man do you want to start with academy of adventure or do you want to you want to touch on our pathfinder 2 adventure sure yeah yeah i've heard some yeah. good stuff about academy of adventure right so uh so my uh my real job is uh, is teaching kids how to play dungeons and dragons and uh we at the Academy of Adventures. And so I run what um, this week, there are seven sessions that I'm running of, of kids running through this fifth level adventure. They are currently trapped in an arena where this character showed up and like created these huge walls of force around the whole thing. It was like, go into the Olympics and, uh, and someone shows up and says, hey, actually this is now gladiatorial combat. And so it was, it was dark, but the kids were really interested immediately because, you know, you don't you don't get the chance for those kind of like battles in front of a crowd or anything very often. So they had a pretty good time with it uh, in our latest episode um, that just wrapped up this week. They uh, they realized finally that the character that was doing all of this is uh, is doing it as an audition to become like a higher power of some kind. And so they're realizing that they need to kind of stop it. And that's kind of happening right now, just as their major opponent in the gladiatorial arena uh, transformed back into a red dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and so oh, they're like, we got to go fix that. But also like, oh, there's a dragon. And so we're having a pretty good time. They were all totally shocked. And uh, it was a great cliffhanger to lead into our finale next week. Yeah. Oh man, we uh we 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 just finished a level one hype train. Thanks everyone for what? joining in what? on that. That's awesome. Uh, thanks for those four subs. I think they were coming in as we were we were getting all loaded up here. So, uh, thank you everyone oh, thanks, who, who sub. That's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, before we move into our our D and D game, I believe you also have um something going on with the Academy of Adventure. Oh for gosh, the summer camp? Justin, Justin, yes, we're getting yeah. ready for the the Kickstarter for next summer, which will then, of course, lead into the next after school program after that. So that Kickstarter is launching on May 3rd. And, uh, and not only will there be lots of spaces for kids to join in, learn to play D&D, &D, learn to DM and, uh, and just play some cool adventures, uh, but there will also be opportunities for uh, anyone who wants to to grab an adventure that I've written about the academy, which is designed for new uh, new DMs, awesome. uh, that'll all be in fifth ed D and D. That's yeah. great. That's great. Um, all right. Well, then uh, let's talk about <laughs> War for the Crown. Oh war yes, of the, War of the, or for the Crown. So uh, War for the Crown. Just a little update uh, is the Pathfinder Two campaign that we are currently playing in with some of our friends. Uh, mm -hmm. This. Uh, this is a the last first edition Pathfinder campaign that got released, but it's being converted to second edition. 
rates. And I love it because it's, its big goal is to update the world in a way that uh, the writers at Paizo really kind of wanted. There was the, the Talden Empire, which at this point has become very small and decadent, and they kind of wanted to like move it along to something a little bit more interesting for second ed. And this is the adventure path that does it. So we, we're playing it knowing the outcome. Uh, not sure if we're going to get there or not, but <laughs> um, it is pretty fun. You say knowing the outcome. I don't know the outcome. I'm not. Oh, a, I, I, I don't know anything about Galarian. It's a it's, it's a like, weird setting to me. <laughs> it's in the player's handbook. It's like <laughs> yeah. you could just you go think, read it if you want. You think you think I read anything that wasn't Crunch? Do you oh. do you not know me? <laughs> Gosh, it's, you're right. It was in the box text and <laughs> yeah, no, no, Justin nobody moved reads. up. I moved on. I, I was like, all right. Well, how do I build this this character that I want to play? <laughs> fair There's enough, that fair rainbow enough. puke I was looking for. Oh man. Oh good. Yeah, fix it. it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, yesterday we 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 finished up our game. Uh, it was it was it was a fun time. It was. It really um, was. We we had arranged a protest, uh, and uh, we all had different different goals. Uh, mine was <laughs> to distract the authorities with a uh, a, a an exploding uh, crawling hand because I thought that was the best thing to do, and it turned out it right. was. Right. I was <laughs> trying to help the people, you know. <laughs> um, I was helping the people. A, you were, you were, uh, by providing a distraction, which was very important to make sure our protesters get, get through the main gates and actually get their demands heard by the people in charge. Um, this campaign, it's, it's one of my favorites because every single day we stop and go like, I'm sorry that we're we're doing this campaign like right now, like that parallels the news where there's there's just started to be some sort of of epidemic in the city. Like it's just politics. It's just, uh. <laughs> but the <laughs> the fun parts about the game when we can block those or not block, but you know move through and get to the game, um, are fun. Are fun. It's a good game wrapped around like pretty darn current ideas. It really helps that we have really good players. Um, yes. I'm enjoying my faux necromancer necromancer. Uh, I decided to not go Necromancer, but for some reason, I, I, I wanted to summon a lot of crazy things, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of wild things. And the yeah. the um, uh, I decided to just go with a regular wizard because I can figure out how to get more spells that okay. way. So by doing that, I, I, I like uh, I like summoning like first level um, uh, undead. So like the crawling mm -hmm. hand. And then there's a second level spell that allows me to make it explode. And it essentially turns into like a fireball that I can control right. where it detonates. And uh, it's Absolutely. so fun. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. And meanwhile, you know, we're all dressed up as as vigilantes. Oh, that's um, right. One of our uh, one of our fellow players has what was it? Uh, is doing an impression of Christian Bale doing an impression of Batman. I think is how someone described it recently. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> it, was, it was an older Harrison Ford doing an impression of Christian Bale's Batman. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's great. It's um, so good. But we're all like named after like brightly dressed animals and things like that. And no one is like going shadowy and dark or anything. Everyone's yeah. pretty, pretty bright and out there. Yeah, yeah. That, that very dark character is what the resplendent red bird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but we got through, we got our demands heard and, uh, and the, the Count is willing to not charge any. There will be no taxes this harvest, which is why we're making a harvest festival now because yeah. we're awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, your what's your, what was your superhero name? Your vigilante name? Oh, um, the righteous ram. That's uh, right. Because I just went into the... Hero Forge and I put like these big ram horns on my character. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is the golden goose. Because <laughs> I'm ridiculous. <laughs> um. All right. Well, that was a a, a quick little catch up in our cool. gaming this past week. Let's go ahead and jump into some news real quick, and I'm going to kick it off because I am so excited about One this. One sec, Justin. What? I one sec just couldn't hear you for a second oh. um can you hear me now oh no technical difficulties um all right well while, while rich is trying to figure out his is his sound i'm keep talking for just a moment keep plowing forward uh there is a little bit of piece of news and i'm, I'm super excited about this uh, especially considering the adventure that we started to write last week uh, in talking about how the spice must flow. Uh, Dune, <laughs> Adventures in the Imperium core rulebook, uh, the standard edition PDF is now available uh, for download from Morpheus Entertainment. Uh, this is using the 2D20 system. Uh, you you ex essentially take your characters on a journey through the storied worlds of Frank Herbert's 
uh, sci-fi masterpiece, Dune, and all, all all the things around it. Um, yeah, I'm super excited about this. Um, you know, I I, I I will say I uh, as, as far as uh oh, we may have lost Rich. <laughs> uh, as as as, nope. as as I don't know if you can hear me or not, but uh, but I am not hearing anyone. <laughs> oh, that's weird. How about now? All right. Well, I don't know what's going on. Okay, you do the show. I'll just dance. <laughs> uh. <laughs> the funny thing is, is I think I think everybody can hear you. So, uh, but he can't hear me say that. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, all right. I'm not, I'm not sure the best way to fix this issue. Messing with things. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I'll I'll just keep plowing forward while he, he he continues to talk about stuff. Uh, try it just happened. Up. No, no. I'm here. I can hear you. Just fine, oh, you can Justin. Hear me. Oh my gosh, I was so... <sighs> <laughs> Were you heartbroken? <sighs> I you was. couldn't hear my lovely dulcet tones. I, I do I think you should continue to do the dance, though. Oh yeah, okay. All right, well. You you introduced the news, and I'll, get, I'll yeah. just dance. Yeah. Well, and I already talked about Dune, so uh, keep going. Oh, awesome, okay. <laughs> uh, there, well, was uh, a, there was yeah. a note in the chat uh, asking about closed captioning. It was working. Uh, when we were all getting set up and then it died on us while we were also getting set up. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to try a couple other things and hopefully that'll be here next time. Um, but yeah, anyway, I have I have talked about Dune. It's your turn. You Perfect. About all right. Dune. I got quite a few things in here uh, that I'm excited about. You know me, I, I can't help but troll Kickstarter to find some interesting things. And the first one I want to talk about real quick is... Uh, uh, just because I am a fan, is the Sentinels of the Multiverse Definitive Edition. Um, I'm a fan of those uh, greater than games folks. I uh, have the Sentinels Comics RPG right here. And uh, they've decided they're going to come out with the perfect finale, right? So they just did like Oblivion and this entire series. And as they've been working on this game for 10 years now, they have decided to make a core version of the game that meets like the mechanical standards that they have developed. And so this is this is it. This is the one. If, uh, if you've been waiting for the perfect moment to get into Sentinels, which is a, a wild cooperative uh, deck build, uh, deck building is hard, deck yeah. game, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, where you are battling against not only uh, a villain, but also the environment and, and a whole lot of other things that are going on. It's it's a wild game with a lot happening. Um, pretty, pretty meaty. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that style of game. Uh, I, I really like Aeon's Throne. That's that's one of my, my right. favorites. I love that game <laughs> so much. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I'm while he likes to troll uh, Kickstarter, I'm a huge fan of Games Workshop and uh, minis and all that. Is seen by last week's show where where I talked to Teos about minis. But Games Workshop has a new Warhammer Underworlds two player starter set. So what this is is this, this is for folks who are interested in getting into the Warhammer Underworlds. Uh, uh, arena combat system. So this is squad-based skirmish fighting. It comes with uh, two warbands. So it comes yeah. with the Wraith Creeps and the uh, Storm of Celestius, as well as uh, two starter decks that go along with it. Um, it, it looks pretty great. If uh, if we weren't currently in quarantine, I would be hunting down for someone to, uh, to, to sit around a table and play it with. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Yes, I understand that feeling as I look at Kickstarters. It's still well, at least if I'm looking at them now, I won't get them until quarantine's over. So that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, cool. Um, I do have one more Kickstarter. Uh, I have to mention this one because I do like party games. I, I think they're fantastic. Um, good ways to get people kind of invested and get a game group kind of going. And then you jump into something, you know, huge and heavy um, if you want to. Um, but this one is called Ghost Rider. And I love this game. Uh, I went to take a look at it. The idea is is basically imagine two teams and there is a single uh, Ouija board in the center, right? And the spirits are trying to speak to you. You're trying to figure out what they're saying, but you on your team are, are trying to figure it out before the other team can. So it is competitive ghost decryption in a way. Uh, very puzzle centric, which I like. Uh, the big main idea is... Um, you, uh, as, as one of the, the mediums is trying to understand what the spirits have, this special object that they're trying to tell you about, uh, you can send them questions. The other team doesn't get to see the questions. You might ask them something like, hey, if your object had a favorite food, what would it be? Um, 
the spirit then begins writing down letters one by one for the answer to that. And as soon as your team understands what the word, the whole word is going to be, you say, stop, you say silencio, and they can no longer write. The other team then, their entire job is to figure out what in the world the start of that word is. Like, okay, it just says M-O-U. What, what could they have asked? What could that be? Is it mouse? Is it mouth? Is it mountain? You know, um, and then as these clues build up, because both sides are doing the same thing, you know half of the clues, but not the other half, uh, the first team to figure out what the object is, is the winner. So short, quick, but I love that it has this like cryptic puzzle element of, uh, I, I love back solving. So I love just jumping to the final answer, given only a <laughs> few clues. And that's exactly what this game is about. Back solving so. is a term that I don't think I've ever heard before until just now. <laughs> It is it okay. It is uh, specifically when you're trying to solve a puzzle and you don't have all the clues yet, but you jump to the answer. You're like, ah, the answer is this, um, and then you like fill in the blanks. You go backwards and figure out what the rest of those clues are. You have a big advantage because you know the answer. Nice. Um, yeah. Ghost Riders, twenty five bucks on Kickstarter, and the campaign. If you are interested in that kind of a game, has only four days left. So check it out. Yeah, I, I I'm, I'm a so a little hug buddy uh, mentioned in the chat objects can eat yeah that that that, that was right? that felt a little weird to me too <laughs> i agree but it's it's that kind of thing it's like uh the spirit is doing this this you know i don't know answering questions that don't quite make sense but they kind of need to in order to get the the hints across so mm -hmm. even if some of the questions don't line up you do pass them to and they get to pick the one they want to answer um but you only have seven total throughout the game so uh if people aren't getting the the clue sometimes you're gonna have to find out what that sofa eats i mean sofa eats uh change right coins Pocket change yeah yeah well, change. yeah yeah there we go uh you know the, the washer and dryer they eat socks Fair enough. Um, yeah. <laughs> the refrigerator eats. I think it just hides stuff from me. I don't think it actually eats anything. I think it hides whatever is about to go yeah. bad and and then reminds me oh, it's there about true. like two or three weeks later. <laughs> it's a it's <laughs> I, I don't want to put it this way. It regurgitates, <laughs> it brings forward these rotten foods. <laughs> uh yes. Yes, indeed. Interrupting the quiz show host and then figuring out the answer before your time runs out. Is nice. back solving for sure, Daniel. Awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Oh. Uh, are we ready to talk about, uh, uh, you know, talk about, uh, what was it? Uh, oh, Arcade. I, I had one more bit of news. Hold on. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I just really quickly, this is kind of interesting to me. Um, I, we, I play a lot of Fifth Ed, of course, uh, but uh, there is, D&D &D has come a very long way. Uh, Goodman Ga Games, excuse me, makes Dungeon Crawl Classics, which is kind of like an attempt to um, key in on like that old school D&D role playing game style, which was much more like you go into a dungeon. It's really scary. Do you go left or right? I don't know. I stealth. Oh, there's like a dragon over there and orcs over here. Let's go. Oh, let's go this way. Let's do this. Blah, blah, blah. Um, much more uh, dungeon crawly, like build a maze, hex gritty style stuff. Different style of play than Fifth Ed, you know, often is. Um, which is why I'm interested in them redoing one of the classic uh, adventures. This is uh, called Dark Tower. It was uh, is often named as one of the best modules of kind of like the classic D and D era. Um, and it wasn't written by TSR. It was written. It was part of like Judges Guild to organize play. So oh, wow. they're converting it both for Fifth Ed and for Dungeon Crawl Classics. And I will be checking out this Fifth Ed one. I mean, it the the setting is like this, right? There is there is a some sort of cave, some sort of event, right? They know there's something down there, and it's like like Diablo style. Well, I want to explore that. It would be nice if there was a town nearby, so I could you know get their resources. And so they like slowly build the town nearby to investigate this this dungeon, and then something comes out, and then the whole area is cursed, right? Um, and that's kind of you as you start this, the cursed region, and then getting into this a kind of well-explored. I don't play those kind of adventures very often. I know you've played Tomb of Annihilation, which has a yes. similar feel, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's, it uh, sounds like something like that, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So kind of curious for a new one, uh, especially coming out of uh, a different, different company. Yeah, yeah. Goodman Games has put out a lot of stuff, a lot of really good dungeon crawl classics. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, tr trying to attempt to use that as a segue. Since we're speaking about 5th edition, uh, mm -hmm. we should go ahead and flip the page and talk, talk about Arcadia. Okay, Arcadia. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
this is amazing. I, I'm a huge fan of this. Um, this is the third issue here that we've got the cover of. Um, mm -hmm. Arcadia is created by Matt Colville's company, uh, MCDM, and is amazing. It's mm -hmm. I. Do you do you grew up with uh with Dungeons or Dragon magazine? Uh, right? Both of them. Yeah. No. I, yeah. I I had a subscription to both of them, and then I bought that cool disc that came out like in the late '90s that had yeah. all of them on it. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> I think I remember that. Uh, I never had either one of them, never saw it. So for me, this is like something I'm experiencing brand new, right? This attempt to create a fifth ed version, like an online version of that magazine. Um, and it really, it really feels like it. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and just pop like one of the things that I kind of remember in being being really interesting in in the old old dragon magazines was the letters from the editor right mm -hmm. so we have a, a a nice letter from the editor talking about like the journey originally they were only going to do a couple of issues but people love this you know and it's it's kind of nice to see some of that insight from from the the managing editor and in this case it's right. uh james intracasso Yes, James Intercasso, uh, who has done a ton of writing for Wizards mm -hmm. of the Coast at this point, um, and uh, one of the adepts on the DMs Guild. So I love this because I, I know these freelancers. Like, I know all of them who are here in this book. Um, right. And so it's kind of like a, uh, like I was telling Justin, kind of a best of, right? They're, they're, they're grabbing all of these amazing folks and putting them together uh, to put out uh, an incredible magazine. Yeah, and this this month they have the Dreamkin, which are a few very interesting races that kind of um, deal with dreams and deal with that whole kind of, uh, I, for lack of a better word, like <laughs> that 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 in the ether type of mm -hmm. cosmic stuff. <laughs> right, right. Uh, which we get out of you know, uh, plenty in Forgotten Realms. But Eberron has a lot of of dream stuff in it in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, great, great new uh, new creature types that you could pay, possibly play. But also the art is incredible. That one there for uh, the sand speaker in particular, just all that kind of like colorful glass work it looks like is, I mean, they're, they're not messing around on their yeah. art budget here either. <laughs> no, no. And that's that's definitely one thing I can say about this book is is the art within it is spectacular. Um, I'm I'm really pleased with the, the, the three races they have... Uh, given to us here um it, they, they seem well balanced uh they have interesting powers they'd be interesting yes. to have at a table mm -hmm. uh you know like this this one called astral architect you know so when you reach third level you can cast a talk thoughts as a trait and i think that's pretty cool like it's it part of your trait is that you kind of can can understand the way people think and and one of them mm -hmm. has the ability to uh, enter someone's dreams uh which i believe is right. the first one i can't remember the name but that's okay um <laughs> yeah and then uh with this one this this is i really like this so when when fifth edition Ooh. first came out <laughs> One of the yeah. things I was really looking forward to was was I had the old spell books from second edition, like for mm -hmm. both the wizard and the cleric. I have all of those. And I was like, oh, man, what spell what weird spells in here have to be in fifth ed? And uh, <laughs> they have they have started to do that. So some of these spells are uh, from uh, second first edition, second edition. I think there's a three five one sneaking around in here. Um but yeah. once again, once again, here, I, I got to get to this. So we've seen Glitter Dust, Permanency. There we go. Rainbow Recurve, right? This is, oh, I think, right. <laughs> this, is, this is, I think, from third edition. But look mm -hmm. at this art. This art is, is, yeah. you know, that's fantastic. That's Wizards of the Coast level art. So Exactly, exactly. Um which which I love. It's just it's not only this like honestly like this love of the game finding new ways to to look at D and D. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, mm -hmm. later here, but uh, but I love that they're focused on the art and this great design. Like there's it's just it's so they were planning to be amazing like right from the start, and I feel like they succeeded really well. Yeah, I I, I like the weakened at Bernie's spell where uh, you can cast it on one of your dead companions. And they uh, will follow you around for 10 days. 
normal stuff. <laughs> yeah. So 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 yeah. far we've gotten three new races, ten new spells, and now we're gonna have some new rules for expanded aerial combat. This takes a lot of things I've seen in some other systems, as well as a lot of really new stuff that to deal with flight, because flight's a, a, mm -hmm. a interesting and complicated thing, especially in fifth edition. Mm -hmm. Um. So you know, we're we're not going to spend too much time on any any one of these pages because you need to go read the book yourself. <laughs> right, but this section is really cool for really you know is. to bring out for uh, an incredible encounter or oh my gosh, if you want to have races like flying, you know, uh, huge competitions or anything like that, this would be amazing for like an extended bit uh, because then your players would learn how it worked and then also get to kind of expand on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's very it, cool. Yeah, I've I, I've re I was reading this, and there's definitely some things that I kind of want to borrow from this whenever I do a Starfinder campaign again, because the space combat is fun, but I think it it needs a little more pizzazz, and I think this, yeah. this has some of that pizzazz that I I was looking for. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, it, and then it, yeah. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, and then it gives you a sweet sample encounter to kind of mm -hmm. use the rules and understand the rules, which I think is really smart whenever you're doing a, a custom rule set for oh, yeah. for 5e, you're, you're, you're expanding on these rules. You should give examples of play uh, so that people can kind of work it out and understand it. Yeah. Right. And then, of course, right afterwards, there's an entire adventure. And this is not a short adventure. No, <laughs> we're on, no. We're on page 26, and this is a 40-page document. This is going to fill up most of the rest of it. Um, yeah. Well, one thing I, I, I do want to, once again, there, there's something I like about the way that they've done this, and it really stands mm -hmm. out to me. I like the arthurial intent. It, I agree. It gives you a great idea of what the author's thoughts were when they were were. were creating this adventure when they were designing it how they expect you to kind of play it that you know there's a lot of stuff that's really cool that you can stick in there that would help guide gms who 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 pick this up off the shelf who pick this up on drive through rpg you know those types of places that they're ready to go and uh yeah i like mm -hmm. it a lot i do too i mean it gives the author a lot of voice i mean and it kind of gives you a very quick way to kind of explain why the adventure is how it is so mm -hmm. as mentioned yeah. here right the mystery is not particularly complex right it's a it's a lot about when do the characters see what's going on figure it out and then start moving through um so i expect mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot of pieces in here to uh, to get that ball rolling and get the characters towards uh towards the big finale Absolutely. It, it, it just to kind of point out this a little bit, the adventure hook for this adventure is uh, the Crystallum family hires the characters to investigate the theft of money and jewelry. This might be through a letter or request, a messenger, a friend of the characters, or simply an uh, advertisement on a notice board. The payment for the job is 200 gold pieces per character. That's enough to get your characters in it. That's, that's, that's all right. you need. You have this nice hook. You have a couple of options to get it to the players and bam good to go <laughs> and then of course right here you have the page to print out and just hold on next to you throughout the entire adventure the the manor map and the major characters that are going to be here yes. um <laughs> we played a party recently in our, our pathfinder game and i just basically drew this exact page on a piece of paper <laughs> mm -hmm. uh right in front of me just because i wanted to know what everything is yeah um, this one also has some really fantastic i don't want to spend too much time on any of this just in sure. case somebody wants to try to uh, look at it, but you know more fantastic art like this. This this beautiful elf uh, is here, but the one that I really want to get to, yeah, the next is this beautiful Zorn. one. Uh -huh. This one, this one's so pretty. <laughs> this is the the prettiest Zorn I think I have ever seen drawn ever. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's pretty great, and it, it I I like that that gives you some tips on role playing to Zorn too. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, it, Zorn, mm -hmm. Zorn, can, and and it's 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 true. Zorns can be reasoned with, and yeah. they 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 highlight that in a couple of books with Zorn in the past. And you can offer them coins, metal, gemstones, those types of things, and uh, and you can ally with the Zorn temporarily until they right. their hunger hunger comes again. Uh, I like it. It's really <laughs> like this is a thing. I mean, like I said, this is the third issue of Arcadia. It's a thing that they're doing is creating these these ways to expand play a little bit you know a lot more things in these books are falling into the exploration and role-playing buckets um sure there's combat stuff of course but but trying to make it a little bit less just about you know running through the monster manual from a to z it's uh which i like a lot so i love that call out specifically in here 
Yeah. So uh, the the authors in this book were uh, Justice Armin, uh, Celeste uh, Konowich, Sam Manel, and uh, Alison Huang. Yeah, uh, it's a yeah, it, fantastic it, it, group. <laughs> they are they they are all a great group of of authors. And here is the thing that I feel like all of these uh, publications need all the time, and that is uh, resources with links to the maps right. that you can uh, then put into your tabletop program or you can print it out and it's just right there for you ready to go i mean it's so easy since this is not designed to be a print publication right right uh you get this for for seven bucks on uh from mcdm um or uh or as part of their patreon as well if you're you know going all that far yeah. um but uh, it's a really cool thing that i'm glad it exists because like i said i, I didn't have D dungeon or dragon um this is a version of it that kind of speaks to me about kind of the, the modern game that I like a lot. Mm -hmm. And honestly, since it's done really well, I'm starting to see other people do similar things. So if this sparks like a renaissance of uh, <laughs> magazines for RPGs, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah. I, I, I haven't looked at the other two. Have you looked at the other? Or this, is a, this is issue four, not three. Uh, have you, Oh, no, this is three. Have you looked at this the other three. two? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they are all. Eco I'm trying to remember exactly uh, what was in some of those, but uh, but they they also kind of like they have this like um, it's not dreamlike, right? I mean, specifically we get dream characters in this mm -hmm. one, right? But it is this this sense of not just the regular, not just like you're a rogue and there's something to steal or anything. It's just it's like there's more kind of you know it's it's got this this sense of exploration to it, and I really really appreciate that. And out of the whole series i'm a huge fan series. is is this a is is arcadia is it a, a a setting that all these things take place in or is that just the this is just the platform to deliver this cool oh. information to people yeah it's just the name of the magazine okay <laughs> which is a good yeah. name i like it it kind of calls out to to what they want you know this like this i, I don't know this this halcyon age of of D &D, um mm -hmm. That's uh, that we're in. So it feels like a celebration in a lot of ways. And uh, like I said, it's given a lot of really good freelancers, not just writers, but also artists, uh, a fantastic outlet. Yeah. Artemis in the uh, Artemis 2814 in chat is saying that they're getting ready to use some of the monsters from the second issue. Oh, yeah. So that's awesome. Gosh. I got to go look it up. I, I read it because there's there's one comes out uh, each month at this point, although it's on pause now because um, as they mentioned in the letter from the editor, right, they had this three issue burst ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, well, if that works, we'll do more. So I don't actually know when the next one is going to come out. I don't think it's going to be April, but, uh, but hopefully we get more soon because they're very good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, of course, we'll uh, we'll be keeping an eye on it here on Albert Soup. So feel free to swing on by and and, and check us out and see when the the, the next issue comes out. Um also, I mean, you Very did cool. mention Patreon. We should go ahead and mention the Saving Throw Patreon. Everyone should yeah, swing we should. on over there. <laughs> join that. Join into that. Also, keep an eye, eye out for the announcements uh, because the, the 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 Patreon is changing and the Exploration Society is is growing and um, expanding in a lot of really cool ways. Uh, and uh, yeah, Chef Alberti is 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 ready to uh, to to cook up some some meals for all the adventures and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so 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 make sure to join up. Uh, that way you can get. Uh, oh man, there's all kinds of cool swag. There's like pins. Yeah. There's one page adventures from the various folks who are part of uh, Saving Throw, and uh, so much more stuff. And you're gonna want to you're you're gonna want to sign up before April 30th. That way you can kind of get into the 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 early stuff and get that founding members pin. Right. So. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, on that exact same note, um, I, I've got to tell you that that yesterday, uh, maybe the day before, I can't remember. There was a wonderful post about the the new saving throw logo and merchandise available with it, and I absolutely got a t shirt. Oh, Jeremy. so you know you'll be seeing yeah. it on this body uh. soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're a little bit ahead ahead of schedule. Let me go take a quick look in the green room. Looks like we got everyone there. So, uh, you want to go ahead and jump into our first guest? All Sound right. Good? Well, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Rich and his guest. Right. My goodness. Uh, fantastic. Steven, welcome to Owlbear Soup. Um, 
you are the incredible game master of New Pantheon, showing up uh, in, gosh, uh, look at my non-watch, an hour? <laughs> an hour, uh, and, hour half? and a half, yes, yes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, wow, well, how are you doing? Welcome. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for Good. having me here. I've been enjoying the appetizers, uh, you know, the... Uh, flumped crostinis are really good this time of year, especially. You know, you gotta get them, you gotta get them properly seasoned before you bake them. That's the trick. Uh, and the, the owl, owl better chef, he knows what he's doing, and I appreciate that. Right? Yes, absolutely. We got to keep that green room well stocked. Um, oh yeah. Just, uh, just to keep our guests happy, of course. Well, good. Um, well, I'm so happy to have you on because not only are you, um, you know, we obviously want to uh, talk about your show coming up pretty quickly, but you are a longtime game master in a wide variety of systems. And yes. that is a thing that I respect and love. <laughs> uh, it, it pays to be a unicorn who started with fourth edition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you start with fourth edition, it's just like, what else is out there? What Please, else? Anything else? else? Anything, so else? anything else? <laughs> I see, I see. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, there was so many different games, so many cool, uh, uh, I mean, we call them indie RPGs, but they are so, so, so good. And as I'm looking back in your uh, your wiki here on Saving Throw, dating all the way back to Masks. Yes. Um, gosh, what a, I, I love that game. <laughs> oh, it's one of my favorites. I honestly yeah. think it's one of the best Powered by the Apocalypse games out there. It's right up there with Monster Hearts for me, so... Mm -hmm. So good. Very nice. Um, let's see. Uh, on that note, I mean, Masks is a kind of a game about uh, younger superheroes. I think, uh, as I recall, it is like third generation of superheroes. So there's there's some some tension between like the youth and the the elders, um, kind of inherent in that game. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's basically a giant allegory for growing up and realizing the people in charge might not know what they're doing and having mm -hmm. to kind of step up. And I think that's just a beautiful thing for a game. I, I love it when games are about things. Ah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. I agree with that. Has that, uh, has that through line stuck with you as you've moved like all the way forward to new Pantheon? <laughs> um, initially, Kind of. Uh, so yeah. New Pantheon Academia is actually the uh, second iteration of New Pantheon. The first season mm -hmm. we used Scion, and the second season we use uh, It's Probably Okay Games' uh, Demigods, which I believe will be available later this year. And that was definitely more about dealing with parental trauma and everything. This one, mm -hmm. it's uh, a blatant ripoff of Persona and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, so it's very uh -huh. much about growing up and coming into yourself. So I mean... It's a it's a wonderful theme, of course, to to explore on any streaming show. And I love that, you know, looking back, it feels like there's so many of these games out there and uh, and you've played a bunch of them. <laughs> oh, I try. I try. <laughs> yeah. I uh, if you ever feel curious, go check out Games We Never Play. It's a now retired podcast where the entire excuse was there's so many great games. I want to try them all. Mm hmm. Yeah. They really, really are. Um, and yeah, so you, you mentioned Powered by the Apocalypse, of course. Um, you have been a player on Savage Worlds, World of Darkness, World of Darkness, excuse me, Shadow Run, uh, Mutants and Masterminds, um, Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, was that was a the exploration one shot? Was it last year? Uh, it's a yearly one shot at this point. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we did it late last year and back in 2019. Very cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, well, good. I mean, that's so much uh, like such a breadth of experience that uh, it's very helpful as you're running a system where, where like you said, uh, the, the overarm system, uh, a bit persona-ish, persona, ish <laughs> persona, um, yes. right? This is a this is a system designed to tell anime style stories. Mm -hmm. um, how do you like is. it? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was I just wanted to hear what you had to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, this uh, when we were uh, planning New Pantheon Academia, we wanted to definitely go in a more anime style with it. And I looked at the usual vendors, Besom, OVA, and they're all wonderful systems. But this one, sure. it's the only one I know that has the fastest, cleanest combat system I think I've seen in a non-combat game in a ah, long time. Very nice. Right. Uh, I was looking through the rules um, 
And there was one part where it was talking about the different kinds of conditions that you can take um, and how they might, you know, affect your your stats in this game. Uh, and one of my favorites was while they're talking about like, you know, missing a jump might wound you or getting attacked with an acidic ability might, you know, poison you. But failing at asking out your crush will give you the silence condition. And I was just like, yes, that's right there on the conditions list. I was so happy to see it. <laughs> oh, we all loved it. Right? It's yeah, exactly right. And I, I love that they there is a focus in here that it is a sure it's a combat system but it doesn't damage doesn't not just need to happen during combat it's kind of part of the entire experience yeah yeah um i i love fifth edition D and um i will stand by that pathfinder second edition is probably the best thing paizo has ever created but um I love games that are like combat's here, but we're really more about the soap opera. Over here, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> I hear that. I'm a longtime fiasco player. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, love that game. fantastic. Well, uh, you know this this segment. I I could, we could talk about this all day, but we want to talk a little bit about New Pantheon because we are going to attempt to uh, make a monster. Um, yes, yes, or at are. least a, a threat, a, a something that uh, may or may not be coming up in your game in a stream coming to you soon. Um, <laughs> um, so, so tell me, uh, when you design uh, a threat for your players, right? Uh, whatever that might be, you know, not necessarily a monster that's going to beat you up, but just anything that counts as like an obstacle, an, an opposition. Uh, what are you looking for? Uh, well, I always like. Um, okay, do you watch a lot of anime? I watch some. <laughs> I have to say no to that, I think. Okay, that, that's completely <laughs> fair. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, yeah. Trust me, if I could stop, I would. Um, <laughs> the Okay, this applies to basically any narrative, I feel like. Um, if your combat is about something bigger than just out-punching the guy, mm -hmm. you're going to have a better experience. Your players are going to have a better experience, and you as a GM, you're going to have more of an appreciation for it because you get to see the players overcome something. So first right. of all, I like to think about what does the combat mean? Mm -hmm. And I know I, is this a bad time to spoil the fact I have a master's in writing and I'm horribly pretentious? <laughs> <laughs> Bring it all in. This is how yes. we make our monsters. <laughs> yes. So, all right, we'll go ahead. And uh, I actually hinted at this last week on New Pantheon Academia where I introduced a new type of monster See, in the game, we have Divinity, which is, it's the anima from the book. We just call it Divinity to fit sure. the okay. theming. Uh, basically, Divinity is god power, and it generally goes to a person. But last week, we found out it can actually go to an object. And I established Bastet, the Egyptian uh, cat goddess, is actually in a deck of cards. So we'll be building her. Very nice. Okay, yeah. so this is exciting. Mm -hmm. Um Okay, okay. So so what made you decide on uh, a deck of cards specifically? What about Bastet spoke to you there? Um, really, Bastet was just kind of picked because I love cats. Sure. Uh, I actually picked her for two reasons. One, uh, cats. Two, uh, she is also the goddess of birth and rebirth. And the reason our players are going after her is because if they can capture her or take her down or... I don't know how they're going to accomplish what they want to do with her exactly to take care of the mm -hmm. situation. But if they manage to do this successfully, they will be able to bring back the character of Orpheus, who is uh, kind, he was kind of the mascot in season one. He was a beloved little side character and he turned out to have actually been a monster the whole time without realizing it. So he sacrificed himself and this is their attempt to get him back. Interesting, interesting. Um... And so, like you said, this is, uh, you know, four seasons later at this point, right? Um, so is it, uh, it's just so cool that, that you're having a callback this far um, and that your players are excited about doing it. Enough that they are going to go and track down this deity, um, or this divinity, rather. Um, okay, okay, that makes perfect sense. And so they they find this <laughs> this divinity in the form of a deck of cards, which gives you all sorts of options. I mean, not only do we have cards as kind of like a classical uh 
magic object, uh, a way to to divine or do all sorts of things. But there's a lot of like motion and agility to a deck of cards. I'm a big fan of uh, our Deadlands Hucksters. Well, you know, Deadlands everything, decks of cards. So, <laughs> uh, Deadlands, I have. Uh, if you ever want to get a game together, let me know. I used to have a good stack of those orange books from uh, back in the day. <laughs> I do love did it. You have the, did you have the one that crossed over with the World of Darkness? That that was a weird read. Oh, no. No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, they had one that crossed over with the Werewolf the Apocalypse. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm going to read that book now. <laughs> Very cool. Um, okay. Okay. Let's see. So, so uh, what do we need for a monster exactly in in the overarm system? Um, what's uh, what kind of stats are we looking at here? So, it's very fun for the system because it's so rules. I'm not going to say rules light, but it is right. rules accessible. Mm -hmm. So, what we're going to have to do is decide their defense and their initiative first of all. Uh, okay. So, there's two types of monsters in overarms. You could have animus which are more or less just kind of the easy to take down monsters you find in most games. And then you have your uh, anima users who get the full array of powers that a player character gets. Right. Uh, however, as this is a little different, we're going to be making an animus. So generally, <laughs> uh, so a really interesting thing about initiative, it doesn't just determine where you go in combat, it also is your AC. Oh, I, I didn't realize that. I've been looking at these stat blocks, wondering about that exact thing. Okay, cool. Yes, yes. So uh, it also makes it so players, if they have a really good AC, a really good initiative, they're acting first and they're hard to hit. If they're bad, they take a wallop. <laughs> it's a good combination. Okay, yes. great. Um, yeah. So uh, a deck of cards, uh, a divinity of cats. That feels like initiative is going to be uh, pretty high on the list here. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing high initiative, low defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, and the, the game only has four character stats. Um, strength, dex, charisma, and intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay. Uh, fair enough. Uh, what, do you, what are you feeling for those? Well, I mean, what's, um, what is high? What's, what does a character have versus what could a monster have? Okay, so monsters and characters can have the same numbers generally, but obviously I want to always make it in my player's favor because... It's not fun to watch everyone fail. Right, right. <laughs> That's interesting. For, for a game like this, does it have a, a mechanic for failure that kind of like helps the, the players? Or is, is failure is failure failure? Failure is failure, failure in a okay. like, All right. Uh, I try to be softer about it than others, but uh, yeah. that's because I'm a giant marshmallow of a man. I understand. I always want my players to succeed in the game, right? Even if it is, you know, well, you rolled a four, so uh, you fall off the cliff. That's it. <laughs> you know? Um, okay. You fall off the cliff, but it's a nice cliff. You know, you get a great view. And I'm going to give you three more deck saves, so it's, you know, you're going to make it. <laughs> Um, okay, okay. So we we have these stats, right? Uh, but it seems like the big thing for these characters are the the attacks uh, and uh, and potentially powers. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like, from what I was looking at, that there's quite a bit of creativity in what you can do with these powers, which is often the case in a rules like game. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the ability of uh, any monster can be something from. Uh, creates giant rocks to uh, gives trauma 10, which basically means if they roll below 10, they're traumatized. Wow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, um, gosh, I'm not sure uh, if, if, uh, if our cat deck of cards is going to go straight for that, but maybe. What do you, th what are you thinking? How, how do you see this deck of cards um, opposing your players? Well, it doesn't want to be captured. It doesn't want to be owned. So I'm okay. thinking... I'm thinking it's going to have very high dexterity, and it's a cat and a goddess. So I'm also seeing high intelligence, but which makes sense. Have a person lower charisma, and we'll also keep the strength lower. So we'll just keep that in mm -hmm. mind. Uh, for our ability, I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking it's going to de-age players. Ooh. Ooh, intriguing. That's very nice. Very tied into the the, the themes there as well. I like that. I mean, yeah. some control over life. Absolutely. I love mm -hmm. that. 
I, I just have this visual of, of these characters reaching out to try to grab this deck of cards, but they can only get like the last five or six as, as the cards go soaring off, like in one large like chain of cards. Um, they, they're trying to get the lead one or something. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, so Okay. So generally, okay. initiative, uh, as I said, it is your AC. Mm -hmm. uh, it ranges from between four, which is weak, to sure. somewhere around sixteen or so. Um, I'm wow. seeing a fourteen for her for her best. Day. What do you, you think that works for her? I mean, very high is good. The, the whole you know encounter is going to be about catching this character, so if it happens immediately. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we want it to go a little bit, right, uh, before oh, yeah. that happens. So whatever they need to do to kind of like build up mo some momentum. Um, meanwhile, these de-aging or other effects are going on at the same time. I mean, yeah, you want as much time to engage with that as possible. So yeah, high, oh, high initiative sounds great. <laughs> yeah. So we'll give her initiative 14. Uh, sounds good. Now, her defense is obviously going to be lower. Uh, it's generally on 4 to 16 as well. These okay. aren't hard numbers or anything. I, I generally base them off of the pre-mades and the rules within the book about creating your own. So uh, I'm seeing a defense of six. That seems, I mean, if it goes from four to 16, six seems pretty reasonable, right? Yeah. They, they are, if they're doing something defense-wise, set. <laughs> it is a deck of cards. <laughs> it's not quite so, hitting a brick wall, but... <laughs> exactly. Um, now, you mentioned earlier that uh, you have experience with uh, Deadlands, uh, so I assume you know how Savage Worlds works? Uh, a little bit, yes. Yeah. Savage Worlds was, I stopped playing Deadlands just before that switch happened. Um, oh, wow. So while I've read up it, I have never played Savage Worlds myself, which oh. is just monstrous, I know. <laughs> oh, we got to fix that. We got to fix that. I'm here. <laughs> right. um, yeah. But, uh, but what were you about to say? So if you, so, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dom. I'm sorry. <laughs> is Dom having a fit in the chat? He is. <laughs> oh. Dom, forgive him. He didn't know. I just didn't. I just, I, uh. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, much like Savage Worlds, uh, your stats are based on dice. A D4 being the worst, a D12 being the best. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Okay, I did see that as I was heading through the rules here. Okay, so yeah. that makes sense. So, uh, so they're all just going to be, which is why they're all uh, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Is that what I'm you seeing? Got it. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, there they are. There's my enemies. I scrolled past. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so this feels like you know you were saying this high intelligence, um, and it feels like a, a deity of this. Maybe you want that to be creeping way up there with that that ten twelve. Uh, oh, absolutely. I'm definitely seeing that. Well. probably the same. Yeah. yeah. So we'll go ahead and set her decks for a D12. Mm -hmm. And we'll set her intelligence for a D12 as well. Yeah. And then that lets you just drop the other two. Um, they may not come up so much. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll set the charisma for a D6 because cats. And yeah. for strength, we will also set that for a D6. I think that's kind of the easiest way to go about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree, right? I mean, it is important to remember that I think in third ed, uh, in the monster manual, a cat could easily kill a first level wizard. I think it was a pretty even fight, maybe more for the cat. So that, that tracks. <laughs> that tracks. I've I've played wizards before. They don't they don't last long. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, all right. So there's also these these conditions in the game. Are you thinking for the de aging process? Is that going to be a a narrative thing, or are you thinking about actually giving them a condition as part of that? I'm actually thinking of inflict. I, I am actually thinking of a mechanical aspect of okay. this, and I'm thinking yeah. it inflicts trauma. Right. Okay. Now, which trauma, is the big one? <laughs> yeah, trauma is the biggest one you can give them. Um, it reduces deck strength, intelligence, and charisma by one die size, down to a d4. Right. So instead of targeting just one of them, this is this is the entire character dropping, which exactly. is a, a perfect way to explain de aging. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it. Um, so how are the character? Well, I don't know. Spoilers, maybe. Um, how long does it take the characters to heal back from something like that and get their original stats back? I tend to go by Power Rangers rules, where at the end of the episode, they'll be OK. Oh, sure. Good. OK, great. But let's go ahead and have I was a little fun more... with that. <laughs> let's go ahead and have a little fun with it. Let's say uh, it would require some sort of uh, 
bigger aspect in a home game. Perhaps uh, maybe they need to find a opposite of Bastet to fix that. or To fix that, right. Mm -hmm. Find yeah. Kronos, perhaps. I think that would be a lot of fun. That feels like, you know, you go in, you see the risk. Maybe the characters realize that this is going to be tricky for really important reasons, but it's worth the risk. And then and now that we do that, we have our a secondary mission to like get ourselves back to uh, to our normal state and then move forward. Yeah, um, that sounds really fun. Uh, honestly, so I I am already scared of this deck of cards flying around, uh, youth youthening. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe de aging. Uh, de aging, that, yeah. <laughs> um, all these players, uh, that is wild. Wow. Yeah. Um, and with that, I mean, I was besides the the specific mechanics for like how much trauma you're going to add. That's that's a complete enemy in the overarm system, isn't it? Uh, almost. Hit we just have to figure out its ability check. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. ready. <laughs> so basically, it would be uh, two of its stats. And since this is a major one and they don't have a physical body, I'm going to make it two of its stats minus one. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. So I think we should go in dex intelligence minus one. I mean, yeah. So this is Just make this, make this the threat. <laughs> yeah. This is the big one. Mm -hmm. Dex plus intelligence minus one. Oh, my gosh. And we also have to determine how much damage it does. Now, for this one, I want to be a little kinder as it's inflicting the trauma condition. I feel like that's more important than the actual damage. Right. So I feel like strength charisma minus one for damage. That makes a lot of sense, right? That that lets the fight go on. We're not worried about our characters uh, losing the battle from hit points terms. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, how much aging are we going to take before we catch this deck of cards? That sounds good. Yeah. I think so. Very nice. Wow. Okay. Um, I love the idea that they get a card and they look at it and oh no, it's a it's only a two. You now you're two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's a little too far for our, our teenage heroes, but <laughs> our young heroes rather. Yeah. Um, that's exciting. That's very exciting. Well, cool. Um, yeah. Now, are you putting this together? I've got to ask you for an hour from now when you step on stage as the host of New Pantheon here on the Saving Throw Show? <laughs> or is this for the future? <laughs> oh, no, this is for today. Oh, good, good, I good. I decided well, to have you guys do some, some do, help me with my work. That is fantastic. I am so excited, and I cannot wait to uh, to find out how this battle goes uh, in, in just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm really excited well, for this. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you were here. Uh, I'm excited to get to know the overarm system a little bit more, um, how that works, and see what your approach is like. Um, I, I know that everyone here in the chat already knows where to find you, but do uh, but, uh, you want to give your, yourself any plugs real quick? <laughs> sure. Um, for those curious, I am also uh, self-published. You can find my works of Lost Entitlements Volume 1 available, available on Drive Through RPG and the Storyteller's Vault. I have been working with a friend of mine, Shaz, where we are taking first edition Changeling the Lost entitlements and adapting them for uh, the second edition. Uh, it has taken these really broad kind of archetypes and made them into classical prestige classes, like in Advanced, oh, wow. where there's only one in the world. So we've been having a lot of fun with that. You can get it now. I'm very proud of that work. So Amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I am so happy that we've been able to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank um, you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, everybody, stick around after Albert Soup to watch some new Pantheon. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to swap over to uh, to Justin, who is ready with uh, with our second guest, the amazing Daniel Solis. Hello, everybody. Uh, I. So I have with me Daniel Solis. Uh, Daniel Solis is an amazing uh, game designer, uh, graphic designer. Uh, he runs Smart Play Games, uh, which you can find smartplaygames.com. He has put out some fantastic games. Uh, I believe Bell of the Ball was the very first game of his I've played. Uh, but since then, I have seen Junk Orbit, uh, Princess Bride, uh, Princess Bride as you wish. And then, of course, the one that, that stands out the most to me, my, my, my absolute favorite, is uh, Kodama. I just I love this game so much. It is, it, is, it is a gorgeous, fun game to play. 
And uh, let's see here. He also does Skillshare, where you can get some information for uh, various card game designs, as well as his YouTube channel. You're all good, Daniel. You can pop right back in, as well as, and I'm still rambling about you. Uh, and as well as check out his YouTube channel, Card at Work, uh, where, uh, yeah, we, it, it's just more sweet design stuff, mostly focused on card games. That, that seems to be your jam. So, that is true. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Albert Soup. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing? Uh, I'm glad to be here. It's been a while since we talked. I'm so glad I that I could like, hop on the show. Yeah, yeah. Last time we talked, you had, uh, well, I, I believe last time we talked, both of us had a bit more hair. Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, 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 you're famous for your, your fantastic hair on your uh, Twitter profile. And uh, I just don't have hair anymore. Uh, yes, yes. So, Princess Bride, the game is called Princess Bride as you wish. Mm -hmm. um, and someone was just oop, someone was just asking about that in chat, so I thought I'd pass it along. Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, how have you been? How are how how are things? How's life? Oh, you know, yeah, life is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you know, uh, just got the vaccine, so I'm really doing doing a lot better now. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, but the uh, yeah, as far as like game stuff goes, uh, right now I am working with um, in, with I formerly am work I was formerly working with indie boards and cards, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, more recently I have been working with uh, WizKids Games. Um, presently, I am sort of the traffic control person who is uh, kind of uh, navigating a lot of the uh, the different uh, graphic design teams that are working on various product lines like Hero Clicks and Dice Masters mm -hmm. and all of the board game stuff. Uh, so it's it's a new role for me, and uh, it's, it's very challenging, uh, but it's very rewarding as well, just being able to uh, impart anything that I've learned over the past 10, mm -hmm. 15 years in the business to somebody else. That's that's just fantastic to be able to do. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know you were you were part of the WizKids team. I, lo I love their products. I'm a big fan. So I've I've I I got into them back with uh yeah back with Hero Clicks, and then uh, you know yeah. they make the D and D mini. So super into it. Um, so. You know, the big reason I kind of brought you on is uh, has a little bit to do with noun projects specifically, uh, <laughs> but as well as uh, just in general, you have done a lot of kind of guides along graphic design and how to make it accessible and understandable with like, you know, with graphics and 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 uh, I don't know, it, easy as possible. So as, as weird of an introduction as that was, um, what... I guess tell us a little bit about uh, your designing that that kind of design thought. How do you how do you sit down and design for understanding as opposed to just like designing something pretty? You know, because it's it's a, it's a different yeah. skill set, right? Yeah, it's very very easy to make something pretty, but but very hard to make something usable. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, so uh, yeah, um, I, sh I shouldn't be so blithe about that. It, it's both both take skill to to do. Yeah. Like I can make something usable, but if nobody likes looking at it then it's not going to hit the table very much. So I mean, there, I, I shouldn't dismiss uh, just pure aesthetics. Uh, certainly, I've learned that now that I've been on the other side of the table um, uh, taking pitches and stuff um, in the past two years or so. It's been a different experience. But uh, uh, to your question, um, how do I approach it? Uh, when I'm working on my own games, um, basically, I would watch playtesters as they're interacting with components seeing where they're having difficulty keeping track of game states in certain places. Um, and I wish it was easy to see where things are succeeding, but it's way easier to see where things are failing and mm -hmm. try to fix those. And hopefully, hopefully you smooth out so many of those bumps that eventually becomes a smooth uh, process to uh, uh, to see uh, the game come to uh, come to its own without any of the hurdles of an um, a, uh, inaccessible UI. Uh, or, or little things like that, making text readable, making uh, icons that are understandable, making diagrams that are language neutral without being indecipherable. Uh, it's it's a lot of stuff that that goes into making an accessible and usable uh, just uh, just a product, uh, yeah. let alone actually making the game work in, on its own. <laughs> right, right, yeah. It, you know, and 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 I mentioned a noun project, and you you have hmm. some really cool icons on there, and. Like and they seem to make sense just looking at those icons. Like, so when you have icons like this or 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 a product like this, and you're 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 play testing it with folks, like it, it, you said, it's easier to see see when something goes wrong. 
Like what, <laughs> what, 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 what kind of things are you looking for to go wrong to, to, to you know, to, to, to fix, you know what I mean? Um, so, so a lot of it is body posture. Uh, okay. So if I see players squinting, if I see them leaning, mm-hmm. uh, if they frequently have to reach over and like, hey, what does that say? Um, if they are uh, saying, okay, what, what did that do again? Or so a lot of a lot of that, um, looking for the little sort of micro expressions that, that signify, oh, th- there's a speed bump here. Mm-hmm. And one or two of those may seem insignificant. And, and, sh- and honestly, new designers, when they're working on their own prototypes, they're e- it's easy to ignore those small bumps and, se- and sort of excuse it as user error uh, mm-hmm. without taking responsibility for like, no, no, I need to resolve each one of those speed bumps one by one. As small and insignificant as they may be, they add up to a very rough experience. Mm-hmm. So that, that's a lesson I, I've, I've sort of learned. I, I have to be humble about uh, just my my prototype, my game is competing not just with every other prototype that's seeking publication. It's competing with every game that's already been published. Mm-hmm. So I have to make sure that there there is as smooth an on ramp into the heart of what makes my game unique as possible. Otherwise, enough of those speed bumps get in the way; they'll never get to the to the actual part of the game that I'm trying to show off. Um, yeah, sorry, I tend to ramble. So please, oh, cut, no, cut, no, cut no. me off. <laughs> oh, I, 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 if if it stops being interesting, I'll I'll cut you off. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, this is this is one of those things where you know my my uh, my day job. I I work in digital marketing, so I do I do a lot of multivariant testing, and mm. it, it, it sounds like you're doing a very similar thing. Is that is is that kind of a process you take? Do you take two different versions of your of your rule books and pass those out, or? You know, I, I I wish I had the resources to do that. Um, mm-hmm. Granted, this is this takes me back. I haven't actually worked on any of my own games in, in a fair bit, maybe maybe a year and a half or so. Okay. But um, that's mainly just because my job has kind of taken up a, a lot of my time to to work on other people's games and mm-hmm. and have their games come uh, come true. But um, when I was working uh, on my own uh, games, uh, resources are limited. Uh, Playtesters' time is uh, finite. And unless I'm at a playtesting event like Unpub, for example, mm-hmm. where I can do rapid iteration, um, it's it's difficult to be able to do A/B testing and ask that degree of patience and, and um, uh, just asking the favor of, of the yeah. playtester's time to try try it this way and then try it this way. Uh, that said, my desire to do that had led me to make smaller games that could be run through like a round or two. And then if I see the, the wheels falling off or if I see a thing, I, I find a data point that I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. I don't even have to end the game at that point. I can say, hey, can we stop here, reset and try with these with this other deck of cards that uh, that I've already made? You already know how to get played the game, but uh, try it with this interface and see if this improves things. So like there, there are little tricks you can do there, but when you're just a single designer working on your own game without a lot of like a company's uh, developmental team support, it's difficult to do proper A-B testing in the sense that a digital game might be able to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, well, you know, and, and, and we are in this interesting age of digital games where we are all sitting at our computers. And there true? are things like Tabletop Simulator where, yeah. where, where I think some of this has been happening. And you said it's it's been a year and a half since you've designed, so I don't know how much you've actually played around with Tabletop Simulator. Um, I, I have not myself. I have seen a lot of. I've, I've played a lot of uh, pitches on Tabletop mm-hmm. Simulator, so yeah. I've uh, seen a lot of prototypes and some very very good ones that that have uh, taken that space and adapted to it very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, so 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 you got me curious. So hmm. what does what with with w- what you're doing at WizKids now, where where you're hmm. seeing all these products come in, are are they coming into you rough and you're you're looking at these products and going, okay, well, this is the going to be the west, best way to present this information? Or mm-hmm. is it more like somebody's already put it all together and you're just an editor in this situation? You know, uh, it's it's been off. Our philosophy has changed uh, back and forth on this a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of times uh, we would get a, would get a, a, a pitch um, we'd sign it based on potential and then sort of develop it in-house or at least sign it and ask the designer uh, to continue developing it um, with mm-hmm. the assurance that you know now it's been signed, we will publish it. And so that gives a designer 
a little bit more confidence to finish off the last 20% of the game that, that needs to be uh, designed. Certainly having us as playtesters helps with that quite a bit uh, since they know they have a dedicated playtest uh, uh, resource in, in us. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes a game comes to us and it's fully formed and we see like, oh, the, yeah, this game's done. It's ready to go. Um, and then at that point, the, there's still plenty of work to do in terms of actually making the UI for that game work, um, because a, des a designer may have a fantastic functional game, but uh, there are there are layers to it that may be inaccessible to a uh, first time player. And so part of our job is making this uh, making that first game, especially the first turn and the first round of a game as like sharp as possible or sharp as we can get it mm -hmm. so that they're committed for the rest of that game. And then hopefully after that game, they're committed for the second game and the third and the fourth to explore the depths of uh, where that game can take them. Oh, wow. That's, that's not, even, that's something I'd never even thought about. Like when you design and you write your book, you're writing for that first experience. You're, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily writing so much for the subsequent experiences, but, but it's, uh, honestly, that's... it's, yeah, it's 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 a rough it's a rough business out there because most games, if they're lucky, get one play, yeah, um, from a group or a, or a person, um, and so you only get the first impression in a lot mm -hmm. of cases. And at the very least, if if we never get a second play, at least we've made a good first impression on that one game, and so someone yeah. can fondly say, "Oh, hey, I played that game. That that, that game is great. You should play it. Mm -hmm. and hopefully, you should buy it." Right. Yeah. So there's, there's been so many games. Like I go to a bunch of cons, I go to a bunch of, you know, gaming events, you know, unpubs, those types of things. And it's, and there's so many games I remember by just that first play and I don't end up buying them all. I mean, and then there's games on my shelf where I buy them and I only play them <laughs> once, but I remember them fondly too, because of that, that first play, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, in, you know, and, uh, 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 you know, I'll draw to something that I kind of, I kind of know, uh, in, 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 and I talk, talk marketing a lot and it's in, in for marketing, it's kind of like you have this funnel, right. And, and it's like that first play is that, that, that first portion of that funnel where you're, your funnel, where you're just getting exposed to the game and you're hoping mm. that, that, that they move down to that funnel to all in that one mm. gameplay to that point of conversion where they're like, Hey, I really like this game. I'm going to go buy that. <laughs> oh yeah. Honestly, like the, the dream uh, scenario, one of many, uh, mm -hmm. is that you get somebody who uh, has played their first time and isn't even done with the game, the, mm -hmm. the first play, but they're able to teach that to somebody else, and it becomes oh. um, almost becomes like a, a folk game immediately, where oh, where you by word of mouth you sort of teach it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the last game I saw that did this very well was um, uh, Tiny Towns. Oh. Um, yeah. That's uh, that's that's a game where once you once you learn it, you're a few turns in, and you can just teach whoever's walking by at a convention that, that how that game plays. It just, it just has such a smooth on ramp, mm -hmm. um, and the arc of it is very natural. You see where the game is progressing. You can read the game state very easily. You demonstrate one or two turns, and it's easy to see what the game feels like. Um, and then there's variants with different uh, different modes for what those mm -hmm. individual pieces can do. It, it's great. I, I love that game. I use it as a yeah. as a like a case study uh, in game development. It's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, T Tiny Towns is fantastic. We we recently picked that up and uh, we play it. Uh, Aubrey and I play it. Um, yeah, it's a ton of fun. It's it's if you if chat if you haven't checked out uh, Tiny Towns, totally check it out. So um, there's also something to be considered about the color. Right. Um, whenever hmm. you're you're thinking about game design and and trying to get people to to follow along, and not just color blindness, but the way people react to color. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So so it's like, what what kind of you know process do you have for that? I mean, specifically for for folks who can't see certain colors, but hmm. um, do you also look at like what um, feelings these colors invoke, and how do you kind of tie that to 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 what you're doing? You know. It's surprising. I haven't really considered the emotional impact of, of my color choices <laughs> so, so much. Maybe, maybe subjectively or just implicitly, I've I've done that um, with you know, if you have an aggressive uh, deck or or a player role, you you mm -hmm. you tend to make that the red player. Mm -hmm. um, if you have something that's a little more strategic mm -hmm. or or like sort of cool headed, then you make that the blue player. Um, yeah. But but more often than not, yeah, I, I'm more focused personally on just making sure that uh, whatever color coding is in the game uh, is as accessible as possible, um, and su uh, supplementing that with uh, 
uh, color independent iconography or patterns or some other shapes uh, to to make that uh, to like sort of double code it where okay. that uh, where a color is matched to something that's color independent so that those two things are always together. So even if you're in dim light or you're seeing it from a distance or you have color perception issues, uh, then you can uh, you still recognize what that thing is, be it an icon or mm -hmm. a keyword. Uh, something like that. Um, even just a, yeah. a player's pieces, uh, you just know you can just recognize it from a distance. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and 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 I, and I keep I keep bringing up uh, Kodama because or Kodama because it's right here. But you know, you you definitely take advantage of that 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 in uh, the pieces are so small, so I can't show them. But where you mm -hmm. know you use a color, in that color also has that iconography that oh, ties yeah. it to that color. That's that's fantastic. And you know, and I've and, and you mentioned the dark room. It's like. Does it pass the pub test, right? Can yes. You toss it in your bag and go play it at a pub with a couple of friends while uh, sharing caffeinated and adult beverages, whatever your choice is. And does it does it survive the 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 pub test? <laughs> it's not waterproof, but yeah. I'm pretty sure you can still read it in a in a dim yeah. pub. <laughs> um, when when you get a new game, uh, you know, and you're looking at this new game from a designer type of, you know, looking at uh, uh, how people absorb the, the rules. That's more what I'm looking at. What's the first thing that you look at? Just, you know, this is one of those things where I'm like kind of curious. It's like if I were to design my own game and, and look over my own rules, I want to know, like, what's the first thing Daniel Solis is going to look for uh, to make sure oh. that this is a playable game? Oh, uh, hmm. if someone has a rules question, how long it takes someone to find the answer mm -hmm. is, is sort of a, a, a fair, I think, a, a fair quality check. Um, and you know, it, it's never a fun experience being being under the gun in the in the heat of the moment. You're the one who is expected to know the answer. You don't, and so you're just scrambling through the rule book. I try to set up my rule books to to uh, help out that player because I've been in that position mm -hmm. uh, many many times. Um, and there's a lot of things that I, I look for in a rule book when I'm in that position. Um, partly it's a lot of wayfinding uh, so that if there's a table of contents, that helps. If it's a long rule book, if it's a short rule book, um, having frequent headers that that break up and chunk out the information very clearly so that I can scan a page and see, ah, uh, combat, ah, uh, damage, ah, uh, uh, long range weapons. And so I can like uh -huh. narrow down, like zoom in on that one question that that uh, Archer has, has about this, about the damage or a bow or whatever, um, I can find that very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess that's what I'm looking for is, yeah. is like easy wayfinding um, no, that's amongst, cool. among many other things. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's exactly kind of what I was looking for. I was, I was just, uh, it, it's, you know, and it, it, I'm not that, not that I'm designing a game, but somebody out there listening or watching might be. And, you know, for, for me, the first thing that always strikes me is of course, like, and this has always been me is is what's inside the box and how it all fits. But the next thing is is being able to read the uh, the rule book and understand what's going on. Um, I, I think for, Takanoko has my favorite rule book for for oh. understanding. Uh, that one's fantastic. I don't know with a little comic think. in the beginning. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's a theme, right? Yeah there's, yeah, there's a comic that shows you it. So, uh, but um, yeah. Um, Let's see. So before we we wrap it up, I I, I do want to know. I didn't find out about Card at Work until today, and I feel like oh. I have I have a lot of uh, YouTube to be watching. Um, somebody somebody doesn't promote it very much on their on their Twitter. <clears throat> it's because I haven't posted episodes in a while. <laughs> honestly, yeah, that, that's a series where I wanted to share what I knew, and eventually I ran out of things that I knew to share. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> as soon as I learn something new, I post it there. It's just very infrequent. I feel like I, I, I've tapped quite a bit of, I, I constantly learn new stuff, but mm -hmm. so much of it is so niche and so tiny and minute that I feel like I'm like, like uh, catering to an increasingly smaller audience. And I want to make sure that anything I post there is as broadly useful to people who are just getting started. Um, uh, but so I, I try to share as often as I can, but uh, yeah, maybe I haven't been posting as frequently as I once did. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it looks for, pretty fantastic. I'm gonna be checking it out. Uh, you know, make sure to uh, check out Daniel Solis on Skillshare, uh, SmartPlayGames.com. He's at Daniel Solis mm -hmm. on uh, Twitter. And uh, mm -hmm. is there anywhere else uh, people can see you, can talk to you, can uh, just Twitter is, is fine. Twitter's yeah. the big one. 
Perfect. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Daniel, it was, it was great talking to you again. Hopefully, we can do this again soon. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, maybe maybe me and uh, my spouse and your spouse, we can all get together sometime soon and play some games again. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. And we're going to jump into the next session or section of our podcast here. And uh, that means Rich has to unmute his mic. And uh, we're going to get it. going on this. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Oh, my, thank you, oh, my goodness. Thank you, Daniel, so much for hanging out with us today. Uh, that was that was a ton of fun and that uh, was that was so much fun to listen to um i have to apologize if you were watching the uh, the green room because uh marzipan came to attack the microphone during that whole thing and i was like it's such a technical conversation to have while someone's petting a cat but yeah <laughs> <laughs> man I, I i you know uh i i enjoyed you and stevens i i uh I kind of want to try that game now. That that talk seemed very interesting to me. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. I was looking up over arms. I mean, I was reading through it and trying to figure out how it works because I wanted to be able to make a monster in it. Um, and the more I looked at it, the more interested I was, right? A lot of the damage, you have hit points, but the conditions just drop your die types down and down and down. And as you get weakened, you're just less effective. Like that's that's a, a tough balance to make in a lot of games. And I think this one is so simple that they can just, you know, do it and it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah, no, and I had a lot of fun talking to Daniel. I I yeah it, it's it's been oh. way too long since I talked to him. I'm I'm so happy I got a chance to today. And uh, I, I learned a lot in that, you know, nice little 15 minute segment there. Daniel is one of the, the oh my gosh, like uh, just one of the smartest people in games. Just so engaging, I think. And uh, he's so free with his knowledge. That's one of my favorite things is yeah. just that he shares it all. So, yeah, go <laughs> go read those blog posts, watch those videos, uh, check out his streams, too, where he'll just like be designing things oh, on stream. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> All right. Well, it is the two of us, and we are in the adventure writing portion of the show. Yes. <laughs> uh, so here's the thing. We were thinking, since it's just the two of us, why don't we go ahead and we just we just kind of uh, build our build out one of our encounters? Right. So last time uh, we. <laughs> <laughs> we created this ridiculous outline for an adventure, right? Where uh, where our characters, it's for a one shot where our characters are um, the, the descendants of Disney style villains. And uh, they go through a portal to find a spice. And while they're in there, uh, they're <laughs> transmogrified into steampunk animals, or at least animals in a steampunk setting. Yeah. It was a, an incredible start to the whole thing. And as we wrote out the whole thing, we just didn't have time to finish. So we've got so much we could still build here. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So let's see here. So we have scene one. The party meets Chef Albert D in the kitchen, and he yes. sends them to the portal to go get spice. And let's go ahead and put that on there to go get spice. The spice, not spice, because that's Dune. All right. Right. And, uh, Very different. So, so then spice they comma the... Right. They arrive into steampunk town, and they show up as one of these creatures, uh, a yeah. anthropomorphic steampunk version of themselves. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, you know, some of the examples we have is like fox and a turtle, uh, an aardvark, cat, giraffe. Of course, everybody wants to be yeah. a giraffe, right? Uh, the, a rat, a dog, and a chupacabra. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I I want to play the uh, the child of Hades who is now an aardvark. You know, like yeah. that's just. Mm. <laughs> I <laughs> I uh, yeah, no, it's. Uh, it's 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 fun. Uh, so then yeah. they stumble upon a dog in a trench coat with a fedora who is investigating something. Oh, but then right. we actually, no, wait, wait. We decided. Sorry, we scrapped that. That's right, because we decided yes. about eggs in one basket. That's right. So the players right. come through the portal in the midst of what appears to be a gang of chickens, uh, who are mad that one of the PCs have stepped out of the portal into a basket filled with eggs. Uh, and uh, one of the, the, the chickens then uh, gets mad at the other chickens and said, I told you not to put them all in one basket. Uh, then the first combat encounter begins. At some point, the this is designed so that the PCs can win. It's just going to be a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little bit of a back and forth, right? Right. And, and 
there's a lot of ways that we could make that happen, I think, before McGruff comes in to like hustle them out. Yeah. But uh, I love the idea that that they don't exactly know what they're capable of because now they're these animals. And also the steampunk animals have abilities that they don't understand exactly. Like there's right. there's a lot of room for like, what is happening? And then McGruff is like, hello, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the crime dog. Come with me. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so uh, we also know the spice enhances animal flavor, but what? Uh, but it also makes everyone on his plane an animal person. Um, and we have decided that the villainy is now tapping into this resource and using it to power something. 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 And uh, the, uh, the mayor of the town is the big bad, and the parents are the goons. So whoever right. these enemies are, you're creating goons for them to go up against. Uh, and uh, you can convince the flail snails to... Uh, <laughs> to help leave their stations where they are pounding this uh, spice into a, its powder form. Right. And you can convince the flail snails to help you in this final combat. And that was so good. That was just because uh, Teos has uh, the flail snail mini and uh, yeah. we just couldn't get away from it. Had right. to be in here somewhere. <laughs> it had to be in here somewhere. All right. So oh, uh, wow. where would you like to pick up? Well, this is interesting because I feel like if we wanted to kind of dig deeper, we have kind of this final confrontation Mm -hmm. um, with with the villains. And that's going to be a difficult one because those villains, I mean, at some level need to be related to the characters. So I feel like that's going to be a tougher one. Um, We have the intro, of course, uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that got them eggs in the basket. But we're we're (laughs) also like there's kind of some investigative stuff going on in the middle. Like there's a lot of room in the middle for McGruff saying, well, uh, you know, you mm-hmm. go check this out and you go there and maybe there's, you know, other combats, other things to fill up this adventure uh, in the middle. So um, I feel like personally, I kind of want to tackle the middle. I don't, right. I don't exactly know how we're getting from the start to the finish, but I love the start and the finish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, so, uh, McGruff, uh, McGruff knows the spice the PCs are looking for and know that it's highly controlled. Okay, so right. that's that's our next step. Uh, they get this information from McGruff. Where does this information lead them? Um, in chat, feel free question. to join in and come mm-hmm. up with some ideas. We are watching. Um, yeah. I, I think it's the, the anthropomorphic thing, but right. I have this like who framed Roger rabbit mentality in my head. Like I'm seeing, I haven't watched that movie in. And, uh, but I, in my head, I'm seeing this, this warehouse, like it's dark, it's scary. There's like, you know, big, huge fumes of smoke coming from the top. Um, something's going on in there, but it's silent. It's dark and we want to get inside. All right. So um, scene four is outside of the big dark scary warehouse right and maybe this is not the uh where the flail snails not the production center maybe that's where we need to go is the source of the spice but this is like a distribution network here or something okay um right Um, i mean i think it could be outside of the actual factory because we have the encounter to get into the grounds and then they could have some encounters there and then once they get into the factory because McGruff already knows where the substance is so you know and and, and we're looking at this as a one shot so I don't think I don't think we can add a lot of investigation true I I feel like I want McGruff to know this step and I want the players to get the next one that's the only reason I would put some separation between them but but I think you're right I think narratively this is outside (laughs) For sure, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Well, and and I think this is good. Like McGruff gets in here, but now McGruff's they're on their own. They have to figure out how to get in. They have to figure yeah. out how to get into the 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 actual warehouse, warehouse slash factory. Uh, and then uh, and then from there, you know, uh, I, I I think that that might be the best next step. I think so. I like that. I mm-hmm. I like the idea that. You know, we're we're getting McGruff is good. McGruff is here and helping out, but maybe getting into this place requires McGruff to, you know, uh, set up some kind of a distraction to, to go back to our game from yesterday. Um, um, that kind of takes him out of the rest of the story. Um, yeah, I, I kind of like uh, I like McGruff as well, here's where your head's at. You know, you're <laughs> listen. What did we say? Listen, son. Um, you're here yeah. in uh, in Steampunk Town and. Uh, you're an animal now. Um, here's the stuff that you can do. 
okay, cool, good luck. Uh, I'm gonna go distract these guards. You get inside, figure out what's going on. <laughs> yeah, no, and I and I I think that's it. So so the 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 fractory is is surrounded by a tall fence, uh, and there is a guard booth. Mm -hmm. uh, McGruff says, uh, "Listen here, kids. Listen, My kids. Bones aren't." what they used to be i'll uh i'll distract a guard at the booth <laughs> oh in my head it immediately went to like uh an old like old school Hanna barbera like lifts up his fur and you see his bones like shaking around and there's that noise whenever bones shake around you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> listen Let's let that go. <laughs> yeah. So 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 he'll he'll distract a, uh, the guard booth while we figure out our way in while the PCs uh, figure their way in. Oh my goodness! Uh, it's steampunk town, Jake. Oh wow. <laughs> um, uh, so also, good. a factory con uh, control mini game. I believe uh, we need to figure that out. I love that. I Oof. love that. Oh, there we go. Yeah, look at that. Maybe from Ooh. the guard booth, there's some type of button that uh, would lower the fence, and McGruff has to press it and tell everyone else. I like this. I like that. Yeah. Okay, so so McGruff has to push the button. Um, oh, uh, by the way, Stephen, since, since since you're out there listening, we have sticky uh, links, so you'll have to load your OBS Ninja differently than before. It's just going to auto load your old link. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I was watching OBS Ninja. Um, here we go. So oh, that's good. <laughs> so McGruff is going to going to distract the guards and push Great. the button. Mm -hmm. Once the button is pushed, uh, let's see here. The light, or uh, let's see here. Uh, the maybe the 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 cameras because it is a steampunk town, so there could be cameras. Sure, okay. okay. The cameras <laughs> uh, lose their light, so they can't see. Oh, right. So that gives right. you an opportunity to sneak in. Now, uh, this seems like a skill challenge. As a player of fourth edition, I love skill challenges. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, let the PCs come up with skills to allow them to get past the fence. Right. For right. example. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, dungeoneering. I, oh, okay. To come up with a way under, uh, you know, to um, adjust the alarms so that the fence doesn't trigger Whenever mm -hmm. you try to climb it, I mean that sounds good. I, I love the idea that a a you know stealth or acrobatics or something. You see a character who's leaping in between the lights that are moving around, uh -huh. trying to find you, and you're just staying in the darkness the whole time. Yeah, dodging lights. Yeah, um, you know things things like that. So and and we we come up with the idea of I like using skill challenges. So seven successes you, or. Uh, players, uh, players plus two successes, not twenty-three. Two successes <laughs> uh, gets everyone in. Sounds good. Cause, yeah, because you you know I, I I want everyone to have the opportunity to succeed as well as potentially you know another round in case some failures, and then uh, you know degrees of failure. So. Right. 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 Oh wow! I'm trying to to come up with like a, a factory style puzzle, but it's because I played the Final Fantasy VII mm. remake recently, and they had yeah. those huge arms you got to move along, and uh, and that was a tricksy one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a tough puzzle. I don't know how to rebuild that one. <laughs> yeah, and it might it might take us a little bit to 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 do the puzzle. We probably can't do the puzzle today, but let's go to the next scene, scene five. Okay. All right. Inside. So so in here. They get inside. They uh, they have to deal with the factory somehow as part of this skill challenge or afterwards. But uh, they're going to find stuff inside this factory mm -hmm. um, that's going to take them very quickly to 
um, our final location, right? So I love these mid locations. I, I think they're very important. Um, PCs get this chance to engage however they want to, um, to get in here. And now inside, um, I don't know, easily like the walls are going to have maps on them, right? There's distribution information. Um, maybe there's just a map that just has the source circled on it somewhere, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, th I think this is also a good space for our control panel puzzle. Yes. Uh, puzzle slash minigame. Right. Um, because uh, we need to build some way to get up to like, the the nest at the top right so we'll, we'll say like the um whoever's in charge of this warehouse maybe is a bird or something oh, and so they yeah. just fly up there <laughs> and you have to like somehow put things together you know uh do some work there that could be fun <laughs> yeah arrange like mechanical arms mm -hmm. um conveyor belts and uh opening doors and stuff uh let's see here let's go with the belts and opening doors so yeah, so so you know, using that control mini game to kind of go, right? And then the the uh, PCs can race up to the nest, and then find the information. I, I love the idea that as part of this, right? There is, you know, maybe there are some guards in here somewhere. Maybe there are some some robotic creations, and if you do this, this, and this they will activate or, or mm -hmm. maybe if you get up into the nest, even then they'll activate. Right. Um, we're in steampunk town. So having some animated objects, um, would be fun for sure. Yeah, have some, absolutely. some basic cantrips or something. <laughs> yeah. And you know, once again, we'll, we'll, we'll add this to our degrees of failure. And so what I'm thinking is we can have a mechanic, uh, a mechanic where the more failures, uh, the um, more difficult or yeah, the more difficult the last fight is, right? Right, right. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, the more failures, the uh, the less advantages they get in the last fight. There we go. There we go. Right. Yeah, because I, 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 I like I like giving things and not taking uh, things away as much. And that that feels better. Uh, right. So so maybe it is something like, you know, the longer you have here, if you're able to do it quickly, you can investigate more, you learn more things. Right. Mm -hmm. But we put like a hard deadline on this, like the guards are coming, you know, you have to right. get the information. And then, of course, like I saw in the chat, you get out of here on <laughs> via dirigible and, uh, yeah. and head towards the source. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, if you wait too long, um, they're going to stop you. That's a problem. Yeah, and um, the boss is clearly a steampunk crow. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. So uh, they 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 make their way to the nest. Oh, say so. This is gonna be scene six. The nest. The nest. Up top. Yeah. So scene okay. six. The nest. Uh, they get to the nest. Uh, and they find a map. Yes. Um, and uh, the map leads to a secret base. And in that secret base, there is a fact, a small factory that mm -hmm. is using the spice for something. We'll just call Great. that something why, 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 why. Uh, to figure out what 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 they're what what are they trying to do with this spice? I don't uh, know, uh, but I love this. Like this is the opportunity to have like the the old um, uh, the old Hobbit cartoon, the whole like the mining songs and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know they're 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 digging out this spice from the earth, uh, whatever it is, forging it out of rocks using flail snails. <laughs> um, oh my gosh! Oh, they're making what for? Weapons grade. They're going to weaponize this spice? Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> and they are planning to use it against the Exploration Society. Society. What? What? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can't let this continue. <laughs> uh, they are trying to turn all the society members. Uh, <laughs> into animals 
not anthropomorphic animals, just animals, so that they can take over and steal all of the uh, the exploration society's uh, sacred artifacts. I like it. I like it. Okay, so so yeah, maybe you know we could call out some specific object they have in the museum that they're actually looking for, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I like that. That is rude. <laughs> yeah, it is rude. Uh, the PCs catch a dirigible from mm -hmm. the nest. I don't. Yeah, that's not even close to how it's spelled, but that's part of the fun of watching <laughs> me type. Uh, what? <laughs> catch catch the dirigible from the nest. And go to the secret factory. I mean, it's just it's you know, for the final <laughs> encounter. <laughs> exactly. Okay, right um, balloon thingy. Not that I can spell <laughs> that either. That's a big old balloon. Um, oh, I like this. I like this because now, right, they get here, and while they know that there is this, they're ready for a flying creature, right? They're ready for whoever <laughs> is in this nest. They're not ready for their villainous parents to show up. Right. right? Yeah. Or uh, ancestors, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I think that sounds fun. And we we talked about them a little bit. Like they are not maybe their their full selves. They're not quite as powerful as they might be. Yeah. They're also visitors to Steampunk Town. Um, yeah, so 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 we'd want to come up with a a a list of villains, uh, who we can stat out mm -hmm. for this adventure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we could also give them like a core, right, a base set of abilities, and then mm -hmm. you know give guidance for well, if you're gonna have Hades, you know, imagine a cantrip like this one or attacks that do stuff like this, right? Yeah. So we could we could broaden it out with some uh, some basics. Um, and then, uh, and then focus our attention on making this steampunk crow, like the, the big dynamic, uh, villain in this scene. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So, cause it's pointed out, right. What if they want to be friends? What if they want to talk to their, their ancestor and be like, let's be cool. You know, yeah. we've been fighting for so long. What about friendship? And then, you know, that, that might. <laughs> wrap up one of those minions pretty quick <laughs> oh man I, I i love this can one of them be the snake from robin hood uh that snake had fur if you watch robin hood that snake had fur it's so yeah weird. yeah I, it's still my favorite uh, disney movie um I mean... okay so let's see here we have about five minutes left so real quick i had some ideas for final encounter i want okay do it so you know we have uh players minus one uh, flail snails. Oh, and uh, they. Uh, but then, okay, so you know we have to do like weird math symbols, right? Flails, players minus one flail snails, uh, <laughs> and then minus. Uh, you know failure points. Oh, so there's fewer of them if they take longer earlier. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. And, that, and, and that'll be the thing, right? Yeah. So failure points. And then uh, you know, and then we'll do like uh, with potentially uh yeah, that's players minus one, minus flip points. There we go. Flail snails. And then that's how many that potentially potential flail snails they can get to kind of help out. Mm -hmm. Um also there are conveyor conveyor belts. Uh Ooh. belts that, that move move the PCs and uh yeah and the enemies around um and then another thing i would like to see in this is the ability to convince the parents to join the children in the fight oh very nice during yeah, the fight that good. right during the fight cuz cuz they're heroic right uh yeah. Right, and I, I and I think that's a, a great way to kind of wrap up this adventure is their ability to save their oh wait let's do this their ability to save their parents. There's a cool conveyor belt combat where people are moving around all the time. There's hammers with flat and flail snails all over the place, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, this one shot is sponsored by Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> yes it is oh my gosh i was just looking up at, at flail snails um their languages are flail snail uh yeah. which is a sign language slime writing somehow that's awesome <laughs> uh, but they're also beasts so maybe you can talk to them these days yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're a beast now you're a beast now 
All right. So uh, I guess that's that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Uh, wow. Make sure to follow our guests. Uh, Stephen Pope's going to be next uh, on this very channel. Watch them play uh, or watch them run some uh, sweet, sweet gaming. And Absolutely. let's go uh, make sure to check out Daniel Solis. He's an amazing game designer, a uh, fantastic person, lovely human being. Uh, you can, of course, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We are Owlbear Soup over there. And also make sure to join the, disc the uh, Saving Third Discord so that uh, that way you can tell us what you want to see in upcoming episodes, people you want to see us get on, um, and other things you, you, you would like us to do uh, with the show. <laughs> And uh, you can get there either by the link in the chat or you can go to soup.fyi uh, slash Twitch and that will also lead you there as well. Um, and uh, you can, of course, find me on my own uh, Twitch channel, DJing a couple times a week. Uh, that's DJ Pirate Rabbits. And uh, Rich, uh, what, what can people, where can people find you and what can they look forward to for you? Well, I mean, the big thing is Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at rmelina. Um, but of course, um, the... The Kickstarter for the Academy of Adventures is starting on May 3rd. Before that, I'll be taking a good break in between this season of the Academy and getting the summer camp and our finale season underway. Uh, we've got some big time travel stuff coming up. So the kids uh, kids are going to have some big, huge adventures to kind of wrap up this entire school year. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. Awesome. Well, yeah. everyone, make sure to stick around for uh, the next show. And, new pantheon uh, yeah new pantheon it's gonna be so good it's gonna be it's gonna be a good one especially if we have this cat and, yeah absolutely uh, right <laughs> and we'll see you right back here next week on the saving throw show at uh 2 p.m pacific standard time have a great week everyone bye everybody <laughs>